Good evening, everyone. Come on. This is church. You know, we do call and response. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here um, with you this evening to moderate what promises to be a thrilling and exciting um, event this evening. So thank you all for coming. My task as moderator is first to introduce our two illustrious speakers and then to engage in a discussion essentially with them on the topic for the evening on how to live a worthwhile and meaningful life or a well-lived and joyous life. And so I hope that as we get into conversation that you all will also, um, well, you definitely will have an opportunity to ask questions and engage with the speakers yourselves. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing our two speakers. We have Bill Burnett and Dave Evans, co-founders of the Stanford Life Design Lab, and I already told them that we'll forgive them the coming to us tonight from Stanford. <laughs> Um, so, um, co-founders of the Stanford Life Design Lab, the two of them started working together back in 2007 when they started a course, Designing Your Life, which culminated in the publication of their book last September titled, Designing Your Life, How to Build a Well-Lived and Joyful Life. So we're delighted to have them with us this evening. So let's all give a big round of applause to Dave and Bill, co-authors of the New York Times. Wait a minute, I'm not finished, sorry of the New York Times number one best-selling book, Designing Your Life, How to Build a Well-Lived and Joyful Life. Welcome, Bill and Dave. Thanks, Mark. First things first. That's Bill. I'm Bill. That's, That's Dave. Dave. Okay. So welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. It's good to be here. Thanks. Yeah. So when I was reading um, all about this methodology, you all call life design methodology, mm -hmm. and I was really intrigued, one, about your story, so we'll get around to talking about that, kind of how you came to work together and how it's been to work together as two people with very different worldviews. And I, and I just want to repeat that, you know, this is really not about pitting Christianity against atheism. What this is really about is having a constructive and evocative conversation about what it means to live a worthwhile and meaningful life. Life um, yeah. and how you all have enjoyed working together and how you've come to collaborate to help people mm -hmm. live a worthwhile and meaningful life. Um, but what I want to start with is what is life design methodology? This idea of designing your life. Mm -hmm. um, what is that all about? Well, the Life Design Lab at Stanford, we claim that our mission statement is that we apply the innovation principles of design thinking to the wicked problem of designing your life at and after the university. What does that mean? It means we're the guys that teach the class to help you figure out what you want to be when you grow up, which we reframe, because we think even that's a bad question. We're the guys to hopefully help you figure out what you want to be next as you continue growing. And then the key thing there is how do you apply design thinking to the challenge of life design? So Bill, I mean, so what is basically design thinking and what's it got to do with life? Yeah, you know, we've been working on this since the 60s at Stanford. It's this idea of human-centered design. We used to just design products and, and services and things. In fact, I, when I did the major, it was called product design. But we use, um, you know, principles of ethnography and anthropology. We, we try to really understand humans and have empathy for their situation and then design things for them that are appropriate. Um, and this comes up in universal design for people with handicaps. It comes up with, you know, I think we're, we're kind of all handicapped when it comes to technology, so trying to make technology easy to use. Um, and Dave came over, um, for, I was teaching over at Berkeley, came over in 2007, and he said, hey, do you think we could, one, do you think your design students need help launching, getting out in the world? I said, absolutely, because, you know, design is a little bit different than being an engineer or a pre-med or something. It's, it's a very open field. It's not really clear just because you have a degree what you're going to do with it. So I said, yeah, they, have, they, they need help, and why don't we try? using our own method, our own human-centered design to design something to help students launch. And that led to a whole series of prototypes and classes and building little uh, experiences for the students and seeing how they reacted to it. I think, you know, we just taught a, a, a full-day seminar on Thursday 
there were 15, 16 different modules, modules in that yeah. seminar, and I think each of those modules we've probably prototyped and iterated a dozen times. We've probably been through 40 of them to get to those 14. Yeah. <laughs> so it's using that same idea of how do you design in a human-centered way mm -hmm. if the problem is me and my life, you know? Mm -hmm. So empathy for me, empathy for the world that I'm going to go into, mm -hmm. and trying then prototyping things that allow you to um, kind of sneak up on your future. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting concept. Both of you have mentioned this idea. So you're saying sneak up on your future. And you mentioned before, not planning out maybe to paraphrase what you're going to be or do 20 years from now, but just figure out what you're going to do next. Right. My mother would cringe if she heard you say that. <laughs> so, you know, we're here I'm on sure a sure she's a lovely campus. woman, but she's wrong. She is a lovely yeah. woman. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so we're here on a college campus, yep. and many of us, I can remember when I was in college, you know, you, you plan your life out. This is what you want to be. This right. is the person you aspire to be, the career you aspire to have, and you figure out every step along the way to get there. Right. Many of us would, might say that our parents would be a little nervous if we told them, well, I just know what I'm doing tomorrow. I don't yet know what I'm going to do 20 years from now. So can you talk a little bit about that concept in relation to the idea of what it really is at essence, in essence to live a meaningful, what does that mean to live a meaningful and worthwhile life? I'd be glad to, first of you just clarify, tell me exactly what's going on in 2037. I am... No, no, in the world in large. And so what's going on in medicine? What's going, how's, the, how's the whole medical field working now? What, what are the issues you're dealing with in, in 20 years? I have no idea. <laughs> You're supposed to have a 20-year plan. Your mother's going to be upset. I had a 20-year plan. That's how I got to where I am now. Oh, okay. Just need one. No. So the no. problem is, when you're designing your life, you're designing a thing called the future. None of us have been there yet. Uh, we might want to get to more than to Friday, you know, or to next Friday, I think we might go a week. When we actually do a plan, um, a planning exercise in our classes, we run three five-year plans um, because all of us can be more than one lived experience in the world. We say there's more aliveness in each of us than one lifetime permits us to live. Mm -hmm. So there's more than one of you in there. And there's more than one right answer to you. There's not a single right answer to you. Um, and, you know, uh, in the world at large right now, the, the, the technological engineering mindset has sort of begun to mislead people to believe there is a right, there's an optimal solution, there's got to be a way to do this right, mm -hmm. is sort of a tempting thing to want to believe. But there are a lot of questions to which there are not right answers, only a series of potentially good answers. And by the way, you'll never even know if you had the best answer because you only lived one of them. And so what we're trying to do is give people the tools to live into the empirical process of iterating their lives for life is a lived experience, not an analytical experience. You can't know the future, you can build the future. You, you can still have a plan. I mean, yeah. you can still say, um, hey, I'm in, I'm in Berkeley and I want to major in political science or mathematics or you know, history or whatever. Um, and have an aspirational mission. I want to see X, I want to see the end of food yeah. injustice in the urban centers of the top 15 cities in the U.S. by 2050. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But, but what happened, what the, what the data tells us is that about, you know, seven to ten years out of school, only 20% of the people are doing anything that had anything to do mm -hmm. with what they majored in. So we like to talk about these, what we call dysfunctional beliefs, beliefs that sort of hold you back. Like, whatever I major in, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Well, 20% of you, that's true and 80% of you are going to take that thing and then build on it and do mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you majored in the wrong thing, it just means then you did that for a little while and then you decided, hey, maybe I'll get an MBA. Uh, because of the, really the way that I want to have impact is through marketing or, or you know, through, through business. Or maybe I'll go into a nonprofit, because that's where I, I see myself now as having impact. So we like these little five-year plans, but we like to have three of them, because you want to be flexible. The world. The world can throw you a curveball, right? I mean, not everything goes the way it's supposed to. Um, and, and then we like to give people tools so that, you know, the, the data says you're going to have three different careers. The data says you're, it's not going to be based on your major. The data says, you know, that this general, I see a lot of people, you know, look like they're in, in, uh, in school here at Berkeley. You're probably going to live to be 100. You're going to work mm -hmm. for 70 of those years. I'm pretty sure it won't be the same job all 70 years. So, How many of you hope you can't talk about what you're doing 20 years from now because it doesn't exist yet? I mean, you want to work on stuff that doesn't, you want to cool? work on the yeah, cool thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Dave and I have seen whole 
portions of our industry just disappear. Mm. When I got out of school, one of the jobs you could have with my training was as an engineering, what was called an engineering draftsman. You drew up the drawings of, of what was going to be made. That's on paper. On paper. With a pencil. With, well, actually with In a, your hand. A, actually with, <laughs> like this. with an ink pen. Yeah, so you or make a rapidograph pen, yeah. And um, that's all, to, uh, just computers do that now. That's just right. gone. And no, nobody, nobody even knows what a draughtsman is. Right. So, you know, you, you want to have a set of tools that are flexible because the world's going to change and you want to be able to, to change into, you want to be able to grow into the next thing that you're going to be. So it's not like, oh, don't worry about it. If you, if, you know, if you can get to the party on Friday, you're fine. That's not, the, that's not what we're talking about. We do talk about five-year plans and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, imagining yourself into the future. It's actually probably better to think of it that way and really, really imagine it well than to sort of try to plan something when you really don't have a lot of data. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to get back to that. I have an, a follow-up question mm -hmm. for that. We'll get back to that in a minute. We've got a book you can read. <laughs> I'm going to get your book. Um, I wanted to ask you about going back to this idea. So in your, in your classes and in your book, you talk about, you call it a well-lived and joyous life. Right. And tonight we're here talking about living a meaningful and worthwhile life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you say that those are the, essentially the same concepts? Are they different? What, it, what, is it, what is the difference or can you compare and mm -hmm. contrast the idea of a well-lived and joyous mm -hmm. versus a meaningful life? In our, we, there's a concept we use in our classes we call, we, we encourage people to live the coherent life. And by the coherent life, we mean a life where who you are, what you believe, and what you are doing are in alignment. That you can articulate what you believe, what your belief system is. You are aware of what role you're trying to play in the world. You're looking at what you're doing, and you're aware of your personality and identity. You can say, are these all in alignment? Am I being a consistent person? Now, whether or not, you know, well-lived and even joyful or even meaningful, I remember one student in one of my small groups in class, you know, we got to a, a discussion on meaning-making, and she said, I'm a nihilist. I've finally worked long and hard to discover there is no such thing as meaning, um, and so I would like to skip the rest of this conversation. I said, fine, as long as you respectfully listen to the other students. You know, yeah, well, they're really kind of ticking me off because I'm sitting here going, that's so stupid, there is no meaning. Um, so for her, living meaninglessly with authenticity was as meaningful as it mm. could get, except of course, for her, as, it meant as nothing. Coherent as, as coherent could as she could be. Um, she was pretty happy. So, you know, because we're teachers, we are two people, in, my, in our role as teachers, our job is to help people get into alignment with the truth as they understand it. Um, and, and their truth as their they truth. understand it. So what's it. meaningful to them is entirely up to their value system. Mm -hmm. We know a lot about mm -hmm. two different kinds of things. How do you help people experience meaning that's different than how do you help people define meaning. So we do not define meaning making in our Stanford class because that's not our job. Um, you define what is meaningful, then we can help you get your hands on that. What, 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 you know, finding purpose in life is one thing, defining the purpose of life is quite another. Um, so we define it individually differently, yeah. but we, we do not tell people the purpose of, of life. We try to help them get their hands on finding it. But, you know, the, 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 the other thing is the data, and when we talked to all our students, they were like, well, I don't want to just take some crummy job. I want to, I want to do something that's, that's purposeful and useful. I want to have, I'm going to be useful in the world. I want my, I want my life to have, be meaningful, right, to have meaning. And so we went back to the positive psychology stuff, and we said, okay, right. well, what psychology, when you, when you live a healthy, you know, joyful life, or you thriving meaning, life, a yeah. thriving life, what are the elements that the psychologists have determined contribute to that. And then we looked at them because we're kind of data-driven guys. You can't just make stuff up. It's a university. You can't, you know, you mm -hmm. can't just make things up. This isn't politics. Um, so, you, you know, um, the, and, 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 you know, the work of Martin Seligman and Chexent Mahai and other, other psychologists who studied what makes people thrive, what makes them healthy, what makes their lives feel meaningful. It's, you know, having strong relationships, having, working on something bigger than yourself, um, having uh, accomplishment, you know, something that you can feel that you've accomplished and mastered. And so we've taken those ideas and we've just put them into the class and made them clear for students so they can be actionable, they can do something to discover, mm -hmm. oh, well, this, 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 feels, this feels like it might, you know, this feels like it might be something that uh, I would be good at and that I could understand in the world. The world would want it. 
You know, just because I want to do something doesn't mean the world wants to pay me to do it or, or to support me. Um, and so we looked at that stuff. We boiled it down to some, some very, there's a, there's a thing in design about a bias to action. Like, mm -hmm. let's just try stuff. So all of these things turn into little exercises that the students do. Mm -hmm. And they come back and they say, wow, that was really useful. That helped me sort out what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. So we don't say, you should think this. But we say, mm -hmm. try these things. It will help you figure out mm -hmm. how to be the best version of you that you can be. Right? That's what we're trying to do. So you mentioned there's a difference in there's a difference between purpose in life and purpose of life, and I kind of hear that in what both of you all are saying. Um, when you said that, I immediately thought, well, isn't the purpose of life to have purpose in life? Is there really a difference between the two? If you're purposely minded. But not everybody is. I mean, the, yeah. the, you know, my purpose in life is to have as much fun as I can. Uh -huh. You know, I, I personally would not affirm that that's a brilliant way to go. But, you know, as a Christian, I believe in free will, and, you know, uh, and, and I believe that God actually gave us sovereignty over our lives, including whether we're acknowledging or not acknowledging God or what have you. So if you want to go do that, you've actually got the authority to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I can say my personal worldview or my personal lived experience might disagree with that. And if you care about my opinion, you can ask me about that personally. If you care about the, th the thinking of the tradition that I as aspire to, you could ask about that. If you want to ask what psychology observes that makes most people happy, according to the psychologists that studied people a certain kind of way, you can listen to that or not. Or you can do whatever the heck you want. So, you know, we, in terms, um, as Stanford instructors, we do not um, necessarily claim you, that we have access to universal truth about those questions. And we can say, okay, positive emotion, engagement, relationships, you know, um, what's meaningful to you, and achievement are elements that go into the thriving lives of many, many people. Mm -hmm. Now, which one is more important than the other? And by achievement, do you mean achievement like I helped that individual this afternoon, or I wrote a piece of code that millions of people used? So what kind of achievement matters to you? Those are, there's lots of essay questions here that are always driven by the individual. So we can suggest things that people can try to work toward because mm -hmm. we've learned a lot about what works for others. This might work for you. Mm -hmm. But is it working or not is the individual's decision. The, the, the distinction, though, does get into the fundamental difference in our worldviews. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I'm not here to... I'm, I'm, I am neither a scholar of existentialism nor a spokesperson for atheism. Right. But in my worldview, there is no such thing as ultimate purpose. It, just, it just doesn't, doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It comes out of, you know, e uh, existence precedes essence. It comes out of the notion that mm -hmm. we're here, we, uh, you know, we are here, there is no purpose to, for it, therefore we are, we are forced to create our own right. framework for meaning. That is the freedom mm -hmm. we're, we're that's, that's the anxiety of freedom. And uh, you either figure it out or you don't. Mm -hmm. But at the end of this, it's over. Mm -hmm. the, the, a, tr a transcendent principle that would organize meaning making did not precede our existence. Right. Yeah, we got here, we got consciousness, we decided purpose would work as part of the consciousness experiment. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, I started out at Stanford as a physics major, and, and I thought, because I thought physics, physics is so interesting. It, it, it actually turned out to be too hard. I, I wasn't a very good physicist, but, <laughs> but design is easier. Um, but, um, you know, like physics, I was like, physics asks the big question, like, why is there anything instead of just nothing? Right. Why is there anything that's just nothing? And then I took this class in existentialism, and I found out there was this guy in, in the 1880s named uh, Gottfried Leibniz who asked, why is there, you know, anything and not nothing? And he came up with a whole world view around that. And then that led me to, you know, Nietzsche and Sartre and, and, uh, and all the, other, the sort of 20th century mm -hmm. existentialists. And they, they had a really good argument for how this works. And it didn't posit something that I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't you know, like, I kind of like the simplest explanation for things. And it didn't include, and it hadn't since, my, as I mentioned, I was, I was raised in the church, but it didn't survive college. So it was, you know, it was this thing of like, oh, well, this explanation works. It works very well. It provides me with happiness and a worldview, and it doesn't require inventing something that I can't, that I can't kind of put my finger on. Mm -hmm.
So you all have, um, getting kind of talking more about the differences in your worldviews, how has that come into play in the nature of your collaboration together? Um, I actually hear, despite the fact that you all have different worldviews, some similarities, some differences, but also some similarities. And I'm curious when you think about this kind of What's in my mind is purpose-driven life for some reason, um, Rick Warren and, and all of the stuff he's doing. And then the idea that there, there is no purpose, I create it, right? But what I hear both of you saying is that there's liberation from both of those perspectives. Um, but I would imagine that in doing the work that you do, those worldviews might mean that you kind of come down very differently on some concepts that might be important to the work that you do. So how has it been kind of working together from that perspective and moving this field forward? So how we began, we started working on wrestling this question. So how, how, how does, you know, the happy existential atheist and the happy Christian, you know, contemplative practitioner get along well, you know, and teach the same thing without stopping each other all the time saying, no, 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 that's not it. Um, <laughs> and so very shortly after we made the decision to work together, I said, okay, so now we have to work the question. You know, because what do you mean? I said, well, you're the God question. You know, I, I do God, you don't do God. We got to get, we got to work through it. He goes, I don't think it's going to be an issue. I kind of go, no, 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 trust me, it's going to be an issue. Um, and then he goes, I said, we have to talk about it. Can I go, I don't think we need to talk about it. I go, Bill, here's the deal. Um, you know, we need to work this through so that if it comes with our students that's already been worked through, there are, uh, there are at least questions you really need to ask me. Because technically, I work for Bill. Bill is the executive director, and I get my appointment because yeah, he said I, I, I hired him. So. Academically legitimate. Ultimately, you know, if we disagree, you know, I just he's not hire very him. dangerous to me. <laughs> I am technically very dangerous to him. I said, You need to ask me really hard questions. If you don't, I'll give you the questions, and then you ask them. So we went up to a, to a beer garden up in the mountains, and we sat down for a whole afternoon and, and, and killed a pitcher of beer, and we, we worked it through. And sure enough, it was no problem. Um, the reason it's no problem is not because we agree on those issues, but it turns out um, for happily different reasons, and we probably both think we know why this is true for different approaches, but um, <laughs> our worldviews both lead us to an understanding of the definition of a human person, um, which is, which is so, quite coincident. And so the manner that I think what it, me what it means to act like a human being you know, the ultimate example of which is, 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 is Luden following the aspirational example of Jesus Christ. Um, the, the way you treat people, the way you think about people, the way you invite people to be their noblest selves, um, the principles I hold about that turn out to be for a pretty different initial set of reasons, the same kind of principles Bill holds. So our worldviews are very different in our class language. Our work views are virtually identical. Mm -hmm. um, and so on those bounding principles, um, we agree on the how and what's important, but we, we disagree on some of the answers. But because we don't give our students the right answer to these questions, we give our students the right yeah. questions, that's not an issue. It's not, it's not necessary for us to agree on that. But I think it's also, I, I would say it's also true that Dave's um, theology is relatively liberal. And uh, the, the notion that God gives you free will is not held by all Christians. I read Rick Warren's book, and I was astonished by it. Um, it was part of the marketing plan for our book, because he sold a lot of books. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, ha had, um, had we had that conversation at Zotz over, uh, I think it was two pitchers of beer. Um, and, I, don't, I don't really remember. Yeah, actually. and, and <laughs> had it been, you know, had, had Dave said, look, this is the way it is, and it's no other way, and I'm, I need to bring that into the classroom or I can't be an authentic person, then I would have said, you know, we can't, we, we can't do this. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I know, I think you have, you, have, you, you are, uh, you know, your theology as we've discussed it is relatively liberal. It's quite forward thinking. It's less 14th century than many Christians I know. It's not bad for a Jesus freak. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what are some of those similarities and some of those differences? Well, for instance, I believe oh. that we have ultimate freedom, that we right. decide, our, we decide the, 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 that we decide how our lives unfold, mm -hmm. that we don't, we don't get to deal with, there's a thing called facticity. We don't get to deal with, we can't change the laws of physics, we can't change the things that happen to us, we can't change the weather, mm -hmm. but we have a choice to decide how we move in the world, how we interpret the things that happen to us, um, that we are ultimately responsible for creating meaning in our lives. And so, you know, and, and Dave's version of, of, you know, his idea of I'm how saying you, very live, similar things. you live, a, yeah. live a Christian life is very similar. Mm -hmm. He has a, there's a different mm -hmm. 
certainly a different endpoint <laughs> and yeah. a different reason why maybe you do those things. Right. But, but essentially the human that we're describing is the same human. And there, I'm, I'm certain there are students in the class who connect the dots for, with each of us in a different way. Right. And we do a thing at the end, when we teach together, we haven't done this in a while, but when we, when we do have the opportunity to teach together, um, we have a thing at the end of class called Ask Bill and Dave. And you can ask us anything. You can ask us how much I make. Anything. You can ask me, you know, my You get to do that practice. a little bit later, yeah. by the yeah. way. Yeah, whatever you want. And, right. and, really, and how much beer, how much beer was right. above, right? And, and yeah. ultimately, and somebody says, hey, you guys, you know, you guys seem to talk about some things really differently. What's, what, what, what's the deal? And, and I will say, I'm an atheist. And Dave will say, I'm a, a Christian. And they'll say, as that work, and then we tell them. We fi fine. We just tell them. It works yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, so we don't we don't hide it, but yeah. it's not part of the curriculum. But I mean, on that point, so yeah, I'm I'm definitely a believer in feel free will. Um, I'm, uh, one of the reviews of the book we most appreciate was a, 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 clearly the authors respect the autonomy of the reader, and we both do. Um, you know, we, you know I, I respect the autonomy of the individual because I understand that since um, in his beneficence God decided that, you know, to allow creation to occur out of himself, because I actually, I actually was, was taught that physics is really good at the how of reality, not the why, because the pre-Bing Bang stuff is kind of, now it's hard to talk about time before it existed, but, um, but you know, what gets the Big Bang going, and, 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 which is a cheap argument, by the way, for God, but um, <laughs> it's, it's really yeah, kind of parlor trick stuff. If, the, if, if you got to rely on that, you're in the wrong yeah, church. Yeah, in the wrong church. The, um, <laughs> but, you know, on you go. And so that um, in wanting to reflect God's glory, um, which is aliveness and love and reality, um, that the human person moves fully into that. And for love to occur, which is the essence of it all, free will has to happen. You can't have true love without true freedom. So I, I've, got a, I've got a rootedness in what freedom is fundamentally all about, you know, um, which, which I think Bill would characterize as the essential nature of the matter that happens to acquire consciousness over the long and arduously accidental process called uh, natural evolution and development. Mm -hmm. you know, so, there's the, you know, so we got to this reality in a very, very different way. Mm -hmm. But we still both say, I'm, re I'm responsible for making sure that I don't violate your responsibility. Mm -hmm. We spent a lot of time, by the way, working really hard. At One of the reasons our course has, in, in our book has, has you know, gotten a lot of response was for many, many years in the, in the secular university, you know, the university didn't think there was a way to try to nurture or to affect the formation of lives without messing with with the answer to life. You know, in a post-enlightened modernity mo model, um, you know, first do no harm, and I'm not gonna manipulate you by abusing the power I have as being your instructor, being your professor. Um, so I'm not gonna touch that stuff. And so for almost a century, we didn't. And, and I always believed that it was criminally negligent. And, and, and so in, in five minutes after saying, hey, Bill, what if we taught this? He goes, totally, let's do this thing. My students are struggling all the time. We should do it in the fall. Let's prototype it this summer. Let's go. It was like a two-minute deal. Mm -hmm. um, because Bias to action. We have the belief that you can put together a very, very structural, very, very disciplined model that can hold people um, freely. Mm -hmm. You know, enough structure to get somewhere, but enough, not so much prescription as to tell you the answer. Um, and so far, it seems to be well, working. And, that, and that's why I think that's why, you know, fundamentally this human-centered design thing works. It's human. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know. Okay, well, let's try some stuff. And let's, let's explore that. Let's explore that question. And, 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 you know, what we found is the students, you know, um, and I don't know what, how you guys feel about this, but uh, you have a lot of conversations, you know, as a student in the dorm and, you know, over, you know, over, you know late at night in the, in, the, in the stairwell. But they're not, they're not that helpful sometimes because, because you're just, you're, you're, you're both, you're, everybody's confessing this sort of anxiety that they have around, you know, how do I make these choices and what do I do? And all we do is we give it a little bit of, you know, we put a container around it, we give it a little bit of structure and um, help people discover for themselves, you know, well, what do you want to grow into? And why are you, I mean, I get students in my, you know, I have lots of advisees and they come in and they want, I want to major in engineering. They go, why? why? And they go, I don't know. Mm -hmm. my, my dad wants me to be an engineer. It's really good major. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. My dad wants mm -hmm. to be an engineer. My dad wants me to do CS. You know, my mom wants me to be a doctor, and I'm like, okay, well, we're, we're going to stop right there. <laughs> so one of the things that um, I hear in what you're saying from when you first started talking, what keeps ringing in my head is living a stress-free life. 
It sounds mm. like living a stress-free life. And I mm. mention that, and it's probably resonating with me in that way mm. because I do work on stress. Right. Um, you know, I do work on racial health disparities and think a lot about kind of how our social worlds, how our lived and social experience impacts in the kind of stress that goes along with that. So this idea of chronic stress, how that gets into the body, how it can dysregulate our physiologic systems, how it can impact our mental health, and we know that there's a connection between the mind and the body. So not having to think 20 years from now and thinking about the next moment, this idea about um, the purpose in life being kind of capturing or figuring out what it is that you care most about and just seeking that, whatever that looks, just like kind of letting it play out, mm -hmm. not stressing yeah. about stuff, right? And so what I'm thinking about is how, what your thoughts might be on how this um, living a well-lived and joyful life, this human design thinking, how it might be related to this construct of stress that we, knows have, that we know has very real manifestations for people's physical bodies. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I don't know the data at Berkeley. I imagine it's pretty similar. My students are incredibly stressed. <laughs> They're stressed about school, they're stressed about their grades, they're stressed about, you know, they have this fear of missing out, FOMO, oh, what if I don't do everything? I've got to do everything on campus, otherwise, you know, I'm not getting enough of this thing, and then there's, oh my God. I mean, how many blocks do you have to walk to get some Adderall? All right. Yeah. One, maybe two? Yeah. yeah. So it, there's a lot of stress on campus, and, and um, that was, one of the, that was one of the first things we were thinking about. I had never really thought about it in terms of the class being a, a, an antidote to stress. I think, you know, if you... The research shows that it's a reduction in anxiety. We reduce anxiety. We reduce some anxiety. In fact, if you yeah. don't take the class, you get more upset. Yeah, so we, we have... <laughs> no, we, we, really? have a, we, have a piece of, we have a piece of research from Bill Damon's lab uh, that says if you take the class, you have less anxiety. You're more susceptible no, to, to dysfunctional beliefs. You're more likely to think things that are not true and be upset about it. But, but I, I'd, also, I'd, I'd also suggest <laughs> that as soon as you you decide you want to live a purposeful life, your stress goes way up. Way up. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. now you have to answer a whole bunch of questions. And if you go down my path, um, you know, be careful if you look into the abyss. The abyss looks back. But if you allow yourself to create it as you go along, as opposed to, so I have a, um, a very good friend. We were in the same cohort at Johns Hopkins together in graduate mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. And I can remember being in the hallway there, in the hallways there, mm -hmm. night after night, day after day. And she would always say, I'm doing what I feel like I should be doing what everyone has told me I should be doing my whole life, but something doesn't feel right. right but she right, went ahead and right, she graduated, right, got her right, doctorate, sure. um, went on and got a tenure track faculty position in Chicago. And the year before she went up for tenure, she just said, I'm not happy, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. And she walked away from it all. And there was a lot of investment in what she had done. And the idea of walking away brought her tremendous angst. Um, and she didn't really know what she wanted to do after it. Yeah. And surprisingly, she's in this field now called, so I say research design. It's design research. I have to say yeah. it my way to figure out that she does it the other way. No, but, yeah, um, the design thinking is not, um, don't worry, be happy. You know, um, it's not like, hey, the, you know, like, just figure out what you want to do this week and to go with that and it will all work out. The universe loves you, you know, it's just going to be fine. You know, that is not where we're coming the, from at all. The universe I mean, we, doesn't it, even it often, know you exist. It, it often... Um, but this should idea, like the not... That's okay, that's The should good. thing is big. That, and, the should and that, thing is huge. And we, run, and we, we, run, we don't shit on you, you shouldn't shit on you either. Don't be Should, S-H-O-U-L-D. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So no, thank I'll you. tell you, the, we, but we've been doing workshops all over the place and we, I, I run, uh, the one that strikes me is I, this, uh, we were doing this exercise and this lady raised her hand and she said, I can't do it. I don't want to think about my life this way. And I said, What's, what do you do for a living? She said, I'm a corporate lawyer. I said, do you like mm -hmm. it? She said, I hate it. Every day I go to work, I lose a little piece of my soul. Mm. I said, why are you doing it? Because I says, have to. I have to. You don't understand. Mm -hmm. I have to. My whole mm -hmm. life is built around this. My whole persona mm -hmm. is built around this. This is what I wanted. And I got yeah. it. It's highly and, successful. And 42 I hate year old it. Consultant we knew. <laughs> she told the story about, you know, she's 42 years old. She's out on the field. She's on the road. She's, she's, she just, just killed it that day, you know, out there with a client. She went to bed at the hotel, 4 o'clock in the morning. She wakes up. She runs into the bathroom, flips on the light, looks at the woman in the mirror, goes, oh, shoot. That's not what she said. And she goes, I'm really good at this, and I hate it. 
You know, I'm making a ton of money. They love what I'm doing. You know, oh my God, how am I going to get out of this thing? So we run into this kind of stuff all the time. So when you're doing designing your life, and if you're going to live coherently, look, you, you know, even if you have these three, gee, okay, I really think I might want to do work with kids. I want to do TFA. Then I want to go get my master's in education. I want to work with at-risk mm-hmm. kids in the city. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I really want to work for McKenzie because I really want to work on change and, and do in the social innovation practice because I want to really change the way the nonprofit world can transform what's going on in society. And, and oh, yeah, I really want, I, I picked up a, a minor in mathematics and I really want to work on big data and how that stuff can really use what's going on in the civic sector. These are radically different lives. You know, very different ways of living, very different outcomes, very different experiences. But what, you know, which one is right? Well, there's not a right. Oh, it's up to me. Yeah, wow. Now, that's a really stressful reality. And then we do cheat some say, so if you're going to do this, I mean, you know, this is a contact sport. You want to live consciously? We say, we're here to help you gain a competent consciousness in life and vocational wayfinding. You know, if you want to actually be awake, I mean, all the great teachers, I mean, whether it's, you know, whether it's the Buddha, or whether, you know, it's Jesus, you know, you know, you've heard it said, but I say unto you, if you want to wake up and smell the coffee and, and live in reality and then take responsibility for it, it gets really serious. And then you have to be willing to learn how to let go what you're not doing. You have to learn how to decide when to judge yourself and when not to. Mm-hmm. And we do work on those issues a lot. But, but I mean, in, in advising my students, it's like the, the, that student who comes in and says, well, my mom wants to be me, uh, wants me to be a doctor, wants mm-hmm. me to be an engineer. It's mm-hmm. like, okay. I don't want to be responsible for you waking up at 40 and realizing that you have wasted 25 years of your life doing your mom's life right. and not your life. And, I, and I'm still waiting for the angry calls from mom because I, I talk students out of their, the wrong major all the time. But that's the thing, you know, your friend, you know, was doing what she should do. She was doing getting right great thing. accomplishment. Right. And she's very she, happy now, by the way, because yeah. she found right. the thing. Yeah. Right. Or just let go of the mm. thing that wasn't mm. real for her. Yeah. Not to beat this example, but, but you know, right up the street at Cafe Strato, when I was teaching here for 14 semesters for eight years, a lovely time. I love Cal. It's a great school <coughs> to practice at. The, um, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> So one of my students came to office hours and she said, you know, and she was a junior in a pre-med, she was majoring in bio, she was doing really well, she had already done some pre-admittance into medical school, you know, blah, 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 and, but I'm, I'm really not at all, sh- I don't think I like people that much, I'm not sure, I definitely don't want to do blood, I, I just, you know, I'm just not sure I can do this. You know, I said, okay, so you want to talk about maybe changing your major and changing your direction? She goes, what are you saying? <laughs> True story. And I go, wow, you just kind of sounded like you're thinking about maybe you don't like medicine. Well, no, no, I don't, I don't like medicine. So you're probably not thinking about going to medical school. I never said that. I never said that. <laughs> are you saying I shouldn't go to medical school? And I said, I'm not saying any. What are you saying? You know, um, <clears throat> and she got really upset. And I said, look, I'm not trying to. She said, what are you trying to tell me to do? I'm not trying to tell you to do anything. I was just, you just told me this. What does that mean to you? She goes, I don't like the way you're talking to me. <laughs> I thought, I don't like the way you're talking to me she either. She probably actually. gave you, you a bad evaluation. And, you know, it would get worse. And I finally, she, and she said, she said, look, you don't understand. I've been on a track to go to medical school since I was 12 years old, and I'm, I know I'm 20, you know, and, um, and, and if, if, I change my, if I change my mind now, mm. that means I, I have been wrong for eight years. I have wasted my life. I can't, I can't, I can't, and she got up and she ran. She ran down Bancroft. True story. A bo- true story. Something going, I'm getting a call from a dean. <laughs> First a mom, then a dean. Didn't come back to class. I thought, here it comes. Three weeks later, she didn't come back to class, came back to office hours. Said, I'm sorry, you really upset me. I go, yeah, that seemed like a pretty upsetting time. Um, what's going on, you know? But that idea, I mean, I made this decision when I was 12. Mm-hmm. And my 20-year-old self could not forgive. I mean, you really want your 12-year-old self to run the next 85 years of your life? Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Have you met 12-year-olds? I mean, um, you know, you're mostly 20, 21, 22. Do you really, I mean, would you delegate the rest of your life to your 21-year-old? No, and, you know, we often, people, one of the questions, they're like, "There's there's a rumor that college is the best years of your life, right? Four years of the best year of your life. Trust me. 
It's way better to be in your 50s. Way better. I say 40s. 40s, 40s 50s is, are awesome. You got money, you got awesome. power, people pay attention to you. You can do whatever you want. The 20s are nice, enjoy them. <laughs> Nothing like the, your 50s. But in your 60s, you really understand. Yeah, yeah, it's really great. <laughs> So let me so ask anyway, you a question yeah. before we break for Q&A. <laughs> yeah. Can you give us some examples of how you have implemented this idea of human design thinking in your own personal lives? How have you addressed this issue of mm -hmm. what's a meaningful life mm -hmm. for Dave? What's a meaningful right. and joyful or well-lived life for Bill? And how have you been intentional about that? Uh, and let me go ahead and sort of explicitly frame that in, in a Christian context. So, um, you know, what does it mean to be called? I believe, you know, and, and I believe there is a caller. I believe there, you know, there actually is intelligence in the universe. You know, the, the, with, with a, a beckoning. I don't think it's a FedEx envelope waiting somewhere hidden under a bush. You know, with your name on it. Um, even though we'd all love to get one, except you really wouldn't. <laughs> That'd be um, nice. Actually, if I got it, one. I'd change my it'll, mind. It'll Maybe that's how we get it today: the FedEx heartbeat. envelope under the bush instead don't, of the burning don't bush. Don't get cute on me, though. Okay. The, um, <laughs> don't, I'm not going to go your, snarky on it, you now. It's okay. your no, example. I understand. The. Um, uh, that if we, you know, um, that if you are, if you are living um, a God-centered, if you're living Godwardly, so if you're living into your best intentions and into what you hope the Spirit might be inviting you to, making yourself available of what, how God might be leading you, and you find certain things are demanding your attention. I keep noticing, I'm hanging out with 18 to 32-year-olds all the time, they're always on my mind, remembering how hard it was for me when I was in college, never goes away. Gee, what's up with those people? You know, so what do you do? You just lean into it. You lean into the curiosity. You lean into, okay, Lord, show me. You showed me this question that won't go away. Show me what you want to do with this question. Not the answer. Like sit on my couch and just pray forever until the answer falls out of the sky like a little bird going, do this. You know, that doesn't happen. Um, and so you lean into it. So I and talked to everybody I could, and I had coffee with Randy Bear, you know, 18 years ago now. And he goes, you should teach a Catholic. And I go, that's a great idea. But I have no curriculum, no PhD, I'm not on the faculty, and, you know, I have uh, no relationships with anybody who do. But other than that, it's a great idea. <laughs> you know, and he goes, no, 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 there's decal. There's this decal thing, mm. and I'll set you up, and, we'll, you know, four weeks later, I'm in front of a bunch of students. You know, and had that, and I, I thought I'd do it once. I thought I'd do it once um, as an experiment, as a prototype. And then uh, at the end of my first semester in the fall, a student walks up and goes, you're teaching in the spring, right? Because my friend wants to take the class. And I'm driving over from Santa Cruz, for God's sake. You know, and, and literally, uh, there's a phrase when Nehemiah, the cupbearer of Artaxerxes, says, and, and the king asks him, why are you sad? And there's one of my favorite sentences in the scripture says, so I prayed to the Lord of heaven and I said to the king. And I don't think you let the king, like, I'll be back in a minute. I don't think that works that way. I think it's like, so. So the, the, you, you, you pray on the in-breath and you, you respond on the out-breath. And I prayed on the in-breath, so what's the deal? Okay. Okay, here's the deal. You send them, I'll show up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. 14 mm -hmm. semesters later. Mm -hmm. Apparently, I'm an educator. Mm -hmm. So that's how calling works for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and so calling and prototype iteration, I mean, the reason design works is it's inadvertently Christian. And it's inadvertently, I don't mean that cheaply. It's inadvertently Christian because it started with the question, what does it mean to be a human person? Mm -hmm. And it said, and we're going to look at that ruthlessly, honestly, not with a bias. We're going to take an open mind, and they looked carefully. And it, frankly, it's not that hard to understand what people are really like if you are open and honest. And so design openly and honestly reveres the human person and tries to respond to it in a constantly teachable way. So the, the posture of prototype iteration is infinitely teachable and infinitely humble. So of course it works. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a deeply flawed human being who's just working on this idea of coherence, right? Um, I, I would argue that, you know, you want to live a life of integrity. And integrity is a mountain with no top. You try their best and then you fail and then you get up and you climb a little bit higher and you fall, but there's never, you never get to the top of that mountain. Um, I, I, th I think living a well-lived, you know, Pur purpose as purposeful a life as I can live is just trying to stay in some kind of integrity with my values. One of the things I told Dave when we started teaching this class, I said, you know, the problem oh, with yeah. this kind of class is <laughs> we're either oh. doing this stuff or we're the biggest hypocrites you've ever met, right? 
And so I work on my personal practices. I'm trying to do a mindfulness thing. I get up every day and I say two things, which it turns out are actually from uh, existentialists. I didn't know this, but uh, looking it up. Um, you know, I, I get up every morning and I say, I live in the best of all possible worlds mm -hmm. because that's, that has to be true. I have no other world I can live in. And everything I do today, I choose to do. I chose to come here. I chose to have this conversation. I chose things. Now, you know, my incredible wife, Cynthia, is sitting in the audience, and she can enumerate the number of ways in which I am not always in integrity or a good person or, you know, the, um, you know a, good, a good listener. I not infrequently hear my wife say, you know, there's this guy, he teaches a class at Stanford, you should take it. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, you know, for me, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very practical sort of thing that you get up in every day and you try not to, um, you try to put something back in the world, keep the campsite, you know, leave the campsite better than you found it, mm -hmm. don't hurt people, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, play, play um, there's a, 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 a book that we used to use in class, actually written by a guy who's, um, I guess he's a, he's not a minister, but James Cars. Well, he was a theologian games. and a philosopher. A theologian yeah. and a philosopher, yeah. It's a, a book called Finite and Infinite Games. I play the infinite game of life. I play the game to continue to play. But the finite games of, mm -hmm. did I teach my class well? Did I treat the student with respect? Mm -hmm. Did I help this person figure out you know, a problem they're working on in, in design? Is, the, you know, is how I me you know, measure, you know, how you measure your life. That's how I measure mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I do want to, say, I, want to take, I want to take the opportunity to, to say something about Bill. Um, one of the great joys, um, and we've, we both have the privilege of saying in various places when we're together and apart, you know, um, I, uh, this is the best guy I ever got to work with. And, and, and we both think that, and that's really true. Um, but one of the really great joys, I will say quite honestly, um, if you want to partner with people, um, I'll take coherency over conviction. Um, probably my best um, accountability partner on maintaining my spirituality is an atheist. When I was on the fence about whether or not to take the invitation to become an entrepreneur in residence at the Center for Faith and Work in New York City and, and miss my first quarter in 37 quarters of teaching at Stanford, Bill said, what are you, what are you you're agonizing? You have to do this. Well, no, I don't actually have to do it. Because, no, you do have to do it. This is who you are. I mean, are you actually going to miss this? What's wrong with you? We'll figure it out. We'll cover this. Yeah. You know, I mean, so he, and that's not just, oh, go have a good time. He's holding me accountable to my conviction. He says, you keep saying you're all, like, this is the best place in faith and work in the world, and you want to be a national thought leader, and they just said, come. You can't not do this. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, you know, a, a nice Christian who's sloppy at her Christianity isn't going to help me near as much <laughs> mm -hmm. as a coherent and disciplined person. I mean, he knows what he thinks, and he's really trying to live that way, and so am I. Um, that's more help to me mm -hmm. than a crummy Christian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said. And, and the nicest thing Dave's ever said to me is, damn it, why are you so happy? <laughs> <laughs> not supposed to be happy. I'm supposed to be the happy guy. I've got God. And mm. I go, well, you know, it's not working for you. We can you know, come on over to my side. <laughs> well, but you know, you've been vulnerable. I remember the time you call me on the phone. Yep. You're walking across the quad. It's a sunny afternoon. The sun is going down. Oh, You're listening gorgeous. to um, Stevie Wonder. Wonders. You know, and I think you used the term, you know, I'm just, I, I think, you, I, didn't you say I'm having a spiritual experience? Mm-hmm. Yeah, which he's actually not allowed to have. But, well, the, uh, no. but he understands that the um, semantic of that has to do right. with this experience of numinosity, yeah. which, yeah. you know, his consciousness. You know, we, we stayed up, like, late, really late one night in London um, after we were really tired and kind of worked this stuff through. But, you know, he's, um, that's an act of vulnerability and candor that, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great privilege and honor that he knows I'm not going to abuse that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we, we, and we've talked about this. My worldview includes mystery. Right, right. I don't know how this stuff works. That's kind of nice, actually. That, that leaves mystery in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's open it up to the floor um, for anyone that has a question or a comment. We're going to have some mic runners, so just raise your hand if you have a question. Actually, I take that back. Not comments, questions. Yeah. <laughs> 
No rants. And for us, it's, I mean, it's really wide open, so. No ranting. Oh, oh, great. Hi, I'm Amy. Um, thanks so much for coming out and talking to me. It's really great to hear from you. Um, you mentioned earlier in the discussion about, um, you know, forget about the 20-year plans, have three five-year plans. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on what that exercise looks like and how do you get from three five-year plans to your next step? Mm -hmm. Well, for one, one thing, I'll talk about the three idea and then Dave can talk about what the exercise is. There's a lot of, um, if you look at, uh, I do a lot on some research on creativity and how do you have better ideas and how do you have ideas that are more generative, more, more, more different. And there's a bunch of research that says, don't start with one thing and then brainstorm, start with three. And, and it has to do with just kind of how your brain chunks things and how it keeps things very close together. So by starting with three different ideas, and, and it also parallels the idea that, look, there isn't one version of you going forward that's the best one. You might go to grad school, you might work first, and then, you know, and then decide to do something different. So we know that your life is gonna be a little bit of a guided tour and a little bit of a, a random walk. So hopefully fun stuff will happen and new opportunities will arrive. So the th we, we always do three plans because we don't want people to sort of lock into mm -hmm. an idea of best. Mm -hmm. Now the, the mm -hmm. exercise. Yeah, it takes 12 minutes um, to have three completely different versions of the next five years. of You can plan, do 15 years of life planning in 12 minutes uh, on a single piece of paper and it works great. Um, you can download it free from our website, designingyour.life. <laughs> Just go do it at home. The, um, it's in the book. Uh, but the, the whole point is um, we say come up, you know, so three versions of you, and if, we, if you don't have an idea for how to come up with three versions of you, we have a backup template, which is okay. There's probably the idea you've got now. So great. So play out the next five years of your life for the idea you've got. It. Just assume this is imagination ideation. This is not project management yet. Yeah. You know, and then, okay, so, so great. So I want to be a teacher, da 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 I'm going to do that. Fine. Okay. And now the next thing is teaching's over. Just assume that the thing you had in mind is over. Permanently, we don't do it anymore. We figured out what the teaching models are, AI can now do that, all the teachers are fired, go home, do something else. Uh, how many people, in, any, we've got a couple of folks over 20 in here, anybody here, you, know, you can't do what you used to do because it isn't done anymore, like dr Bill mentioned drafting, we both had like four things fall out from under us, uh, that stuff happens all the time. So thing two is the thing you would do if you can't do thing one. And thing three is the thing you would do if neither money nor regard were an object. If I could promise you you're going to have enough money to live, and I swear they won't promise, they will not laugh at you, what would you do? And almost everybody has an answer to those three mm -hmm. questions. Uh, so that's kind of the quick backup. And why the wild idea? We really want you to have the, you know, the Cirque du Soleil clown thing. No, seriously, put it on paper, write it down. Why? You know, design is renowned for having wild ideas and like they're silly. No, you have wild ideas because your internal critic will cut off any idea it can't understand instantaneously. And if you can force yourself to have the wild, silly idea, you can turn the internal critic off. And once the internal critic is off, you have access to many more ideas because your good and hidden ideas are wiped out by the internal critic that keeps slamming the door. Um, and so you have to find ways to do that. The wild ideas may not be better. Sometimes they might. But if you don't have access to your wild idea, you probably have a lack of access to tons of good ideas because that very, very objective, that silly voice has just shut you down. So you want to shut that critic up. Mm -hmm. That's the approach we take. Yeah. Any question? Yeah. Any more questions? Yep. Have a Hi, go ahead. My name is Luke. Um, I have a question. You, you have talked about being true to yourself. Yep. And I'm wondering if everyone were to do that, are there jobs in this world that require the highest coherency, integrity, and competence which might be underserved right now? Jobs in the world that require integrity? Yeah, that the require the formation your class will provide that just aren't being done right now because people don't feel like it's being tutored themselves to do that job. Well, uh, there's certainly roles that are reasonably rote Okay, so let's say, you know, you're, I mean, there aren't many factory workers left, but if you're a factory worker and all you're responsible to do in the role that you have in your, in your job, you know, is, is a time and movement thing, you know, and while you're doing that, you're muttering horrible things about your wife, you know, but you still put the brakes on the car right, you know, as opposed to, you know, you say loving things about your children and you put the brakes on the car right, you know, chances are the brakes will probably work. Um, so in that regard, maybe that one doesn't, but if you're dealing with people, if you're making judgments about things that matter, you know, in people's lives, you're screwing with people's lives, um, you know, then w what you do is who you are. 
you know, and so, uh, so being a person of coherency and a person of integrity, which is not quite the same thing, it's a, that's actually a higher bar. Um, you can be coherent and ignoble. <laughs> you can be a coherent mass murderer, probably. Yeah, you can be a coherent mass murderer. But I think uh, something else in your question, you were saying, that, well, are there jobs out there that are underserved? Yeah. Because, because we're, un we're undersupplied in coherent people, so we got some jobs going wanting or jobs being poorly done. There yeah, are things in this world that are deeply needed that aren't being done. Or oh, I'm sure of that. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, uh, my, my, uh, I've got three, three kids. My youngest is still in school. He's at Northeastern, and he's studying political science. And he, he deeply believes that his generation needs to get involved in politics because our generation has obviously screwed it up. <laughs> and, um, and, that we, and that we need a political system that works. So he's been an intern you know, on a governor's campaign. He's been an intern mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in Congress. And um, you know, there's, a, there's a rumor that college students don't care about politics and millennials don't, you know, don't get involved. Um, he, he desperately thinks that's, got, one, that's wrong, and two, it's got to change. You guys have to get involved. We have to have a, so, so high integrity people working in public service who are working to create, you know, conversations where we stop polarizing and start getting, you know, things done. It's, there's not, there, there, you can, there's tremendous integrity in compromising between two you know, opposing points of view to move the, you know, to move the, the bar forward, right? And he's, he's super dedicated to that, and that's, that's great. And, and I think there's many, many people in, in uh, his generation, and if you're in that age, your generation, who um, need to get, you know, like, get called to service because we have to have a, a government that functions. We have to have social services that function. There has to be safety nets and stuff. And, and, and you know, you want the most, under, most underserved, high integrity job I can think of is a sixth grade teacher. I don't know about yeah. you, but sixth grade is when I had a teacher who said, stop screwing around, read these books, you know, and, and pay attention. And just turned me on to reading, to literature, to the world. Um, and, you know, it's not that's a, a thankless not, not job. job. Well, I would say, actually, thinking about your... No, I, no, I don't believe uh, that coherency is going to be what's going to solve the problem that's on my mind. And I think the bill is looking... I mean, we could be highly coherent people and never get around to some of the things that really have to get worked on. So coherency just means you're in alignment with your values. I would say there are some values we need more people to want to get coherent to, for like playing the long game. Everybody's playing the short game right now. You know, um, having values that transcend personal satisfaction. I mean, what if it takes a way long time for it to work? Well, I want something that's gonna work. I want the positive feedback of it worked quickly. I don't wanna work in this field, you know. Uh, I wanna work in that field because I'm getting good positive feedback. Well, I mean, it's a really understandable thing. The research that you do around, you yeah, know, you're, you're playing a long game. stress and right. health, Longitudinal right? research, I mean, good luck with that. It, no, you know, but, it, um, but it's, it's usually... <laughs> that's a hard problem. I mean, I was told when I started my job that if you're, if you're in academia, and especially in public health, then you have to be in it, and you, you have to be in it for the joy you get out of knowing that you're contributing to a body of knowledge that will eventually change people's lives. You probably won't see it you in your see lifetime. It. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. So, so there are lots of values that are currently less popular than they could be. And now we, we, say, we have strong opinions about that kind of stuff, which we hold because we're not value providers. And if you ask us in office hours privately, you want to know what he thinks, I'll tell you. You know what I think, I'll tell you. And at the end of the class, we sometimes will do, and one of the last things we'll say is, you know, and my wish, so Bill will say, my wish for you is, and my, I will say, my wish for you is, but that's about as heavy handed as we ever get. So not, that, that's inappropriate for us to abuse our position of power that way. Other questions for us on anything? Yeah. From someone who's a little bit more than 20 years old. Um, Yay! It's, it's, a, it's, it's actually a, a, it's a, it's a question that, it's motivated from, I'm a scientist, and I would love to have like a control group, people who didn't take yeah, the class, yeah. and then the people who did. So the question is, and I haven't read your book yet, but I'm going to, have you tracked, have you tracked with graduates of your class, two, three, five, mm -hmm. maybe three, five-year programs after graduating to see how they've done? And if you have, yeah. have their stories found their way into your book? So, uh, oh, absolutely. The stories are in, uh, found their way into the book, and we do get because we've been doing this for eight, nine years now. Um, 
We have many, many anecdotes, and we do not have scientific yeah. We do not have longitudinal, longitudinal data. data. So real longitudinal data, we would give our right arm to get. It's really expensive to get it funded. Right. Uh, we have tons of anecdotal long-term data, yeah. and we have legitimate control-based short-term data. Yeah, we did a, we did a, a two, two, exper uh, two PhD studies, one, a control group didn't take the class, a control group of people, a group that did take the class, and then an interesting group who tried to get in but couldn't, because we were trying to determine, is it just the intention? Are we just selecting for the rightly mm. motivated yeah. kids? Mm. They don't need any help, they're just the good kids. It, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and 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 the data was fairly... Um, just sign up for the class and don't come, that's all you really need to do. Yeah, just need intention. So we have, we have things like that, but on, in terms of, you know, have we studied then that group three years out, five years out, seven years out? And we haven't been able to. We're looking to find ways to do that. And more interest, uh, something more interesting that came up for me um, recently is um, there's a, a, a scientist, a uh, psychologist and a neuroscientist at Stanford who's studying what's called um, uh, your future self. If you have a strong sense of future self, you, you just, ha you know, and he can track that neurologically. He can see what circuits turn on in a person with a strong sense of future self. You will save more money because you, of that. You will be more ethical because of that. You will, um, you will take care, better care of your health because of that. And he has neurological markers for this. And so what we're re really interested in seeing is scan your brain, take our class, did your sense of future self increase mm -hmm. or not? Did mm -hmm. those neur neural pathways build or not? So we're looking at that kind of research. And we have tons and tons and tons of really nice yeah. emails from people saying, yeah. I'm still using this stuff. In fact, I'm yeah. teaching my friends because they're all screwed up. Yeah. And, no, I mean, um, and, you know, and, I, and it really helps me. And I've mm -hmm. gone through a couple of job transitions, but I really feel like I'm on the right path. So we get that kind of and stuff. And even if I make a mistake, I think I know what to do. And, that, and a very common report is, and I've been talking to my friends who graduated with me, and some of them are doing great, and some kind of hit the wall and were surprised. And the ones who hit the wall and were surprised are really upset, like, whoa, how did I blow this? And I thought I was doing the right thing, and it didn't work out. So I got to do the next thing, but I'm not, I mean, I trusted me before, and he screwed it up. So, you know, and yeah. so the, the anxiety starts really shooting up two, three years out of school. Uh, unless you believe, oh, this is an iterative process, you know, I'm trying to just turn into my 25-year-old self and mm -hmm. he's going to save the day anyway, um, you know, because he's better than I am. And, and this, this methodology does work and I can just deploy it again, yeah. you know. I didn't do it wrong, I just made a mistake. It's not the same thing. Anything else? Shoot. Hi, I'm Grace. Hi, Grace. Hi, I just, I'm a huge fan, so I'm kind of nervous right now. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, my friend Nicole and I are actually reading your book together and like going through it together. Yeah, great. You bought two though, right? If I, <laughs> we have multiple copies. Okay, okay. Um, Don't share the book. <laughs> No, yeah, and yeah, actually, yeah. we have like my at my workplace, we were doing like an accountability group with a lot of other people on okay, one yeah, bigger okay. book. Right, yeah. Um, but yeah, I was gonna ask about like, so I love that you guys incorporate a lot of activities that are um, meant to like bring you um, to realize like what are your true gifts and talents and strengths, mm -hmm. um, such as like the activity journal and like the dashboard of like like what do you actually enjoy versus the yep. non the draining stuff. Yep. Um, and while I was doing it, and I've talked to other people too who feel the same way, um, I noticed that. Whoops. Oh, sorry. I noticed that um, it's kind of easy to just like be biased about answering those questions. Kind of similar to like when you take a personality test, yeah. And you just like automatically sway to certain answers because yeah. you're kind of been you've been prescribed a role or an identity your whole life by your parents, by your peers. And so I was wondering, do you have like advice or? What's the best way to like be true to yourself, even when you're answering those questions? You know, you you, you you've almost you, you've almost demonstrated that you know yeah. the answer. I was just gonna say you're halfway home. Yeah, um, look, you just caught yourself in the act of being biased. Yeah, Guess so, what? So it's going to be harder to re. Oh, there I go, being biased again. One one of the things we um, you know liked a lot when we discovered it is. Um, the work of a couple of the psych positive psychologists who are looking at emotional intelligence, Dan Goleman and, and Barry Schwartz and some other people. Dan Gilbert. And Dan Gilbert. And um, there's this part of your brain called the basal ganglia. It's a really early part of the brain, even like reptiles have it, but it, it valences emotional decisions. If you do something and you get positive 
effects, it goes, that was a good one. And if you get, do something, you get negative emotional effects. So that was a bad one, you know? So, and, and it helps your, the rest of your brain make decisions. The problem is, it's such an early part of the brain that it's not wired to the part of your brain that talks to you. So your consciousness, the, the, the thing that's trying to make decisions that you're aware of, it can't, expl it can't give you that data. It's only connected to your gut. It's connected and, to and your, your emotions. Your, yeah. stu your stomach and your limbic system. So when you get that feeling like, I just filled out this dashboard, but it doesn't really feel authentic. Th th I filled it out like that's who I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. you, you already know it. You just, but in our society, we're so used to listening to that part of our brain that talks that we don't give the other parts mm. of our intelligence the same credibility. But you know it. You just faked it. So cross it out and do it again. And you don't have to show it to anybody. If, if, if the way you think you are would disappoint someone who has another view of you, that's their problem. One of our favorite questions is, we just did it like five times yesterday. We do an exercise, do this thing, write, you know, write, write this narrative, do this version, and then we say, now read over the work you just did as though you had not written it, asking the question, what do you notice? What do you notice? Pay attention. Yeah. You know, and we define, the, the word discernment is actually in the bottom layer of our model that we teach in the class, not in the book. The, um, and, and by discernment, which is a, a spiritual word very often used, but by discernment, we define discernment as, in the course, uh, deploying decision making that involves more than one form of knowing not merely cognitive objective knowing, but also emotional knowing, you know, all the affect of emotional, spiritual, intuitive, kinesthetic, social. There are lots of ways you know. You are, you, you know, this is not a transport mechanism for your mind. Bill will often say, you are an embodied until you don't have a body, you are one. You are a whole person, which again is very, I mean, it's very, very Christian. So the whole idea of, you know, you know, whatever's true, whatever is lovely, let your mind dwell in these things. I mean, you want to have access to the entirety of the possibility of the revelation of reality to you. So you want to get really good at paying attention and noticing and listening to what's actually true. We call it voice recognition. Yeah, can you learn to recognize the voice of truth within yourself? You know yourself? what the really good news is for you? It is highly unlikely you will wake up at 40 in the wrong job because you're already asking yourself, wait a minute, is this, is this true mm -hmm. for me? Yeah. Look, we all have lots, of, I mean, I grew up with, you know, lots of voices in my head. My father wanted me to be this, my mother wanted me to be this, you know, the community, of, of the, my friends were all, you know, going off to these schools, and I had to do it too. And it took a long time to kind of go, well, wait a minute, yeah. is that what I want? Mm -hmm. And, and number, mm -hmm. the number one thing Dave and I say we do in office hours is, we just give permission. People go, is it okay if I don't really want to be an engineer anymore? I'm like, yes. <laughs> Since we're in charge of the universe, yes. Yes, it's okay. <laughs> now, why do we do that? And it's, you know, I mean, what if I wanted to be a poet yeah. instead? That would be great. <laughs> Hungry, but great. Yeah, you have to make some, you gotta, you're going to make some trade-offs. That's you know? a consequence, engineer, not a rule. 110,000. Yeah. Poet? You're working at Starbucks, but it's, That's it's okay. if it's authentic, it's totally okay. And it just, it's just, we don't, we, the, you, it turns out the people who show up in office hours know exactly what they want to do. They're just wanting someone to tell them it's okay. Mm -hmm. Now, is that because they're not up to or there's something wrong with them? No. Um, Look, this is we're, hard. We're, you know, even science, we're social people. It's very, very, how many of you, it, it's, it's hard to parse all that noise in there. It's very hard to be yourself by yourself. It really does take, you know, for those, I'm a Christian. I'm a communitarian by definition. I mean, you know, God's a community. I think the def fundamental definition of reality is a community. I mean, you know, a proton's not interesting without a neutron and an electron. I mean, conversation interaction in a dynamic form is the fundamental nature of reality. You know, you all by yourself won't ever make any sense. You can't. You can't even hear yourself by yourself. But you can hear yourself with some, How many had the experience, you're, you're sharing something, you know, that time where, you know, you know let's talk for a long time, and she says nothing, thanks so much, that was so helpful, you know. Um, and while you're talking to somebody else, you actually hear yourself say something, go, oh, that's true, I do think that. 
Um, yeah. So this whole idea of being in the conversation with yourself and being in the conversation with other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're slipping into teaching class. I knew that would happen. Um, we probably have time for maybe one, maybe one more or two question. more. Yeah, oh, yeah. go ahead. Give us how about Hi. the simple question. We can just like yes or no. Yeah. yeah. Mine's not simple. Um, my name's Rachel. I'm a grad student here, and I'm about halfway through the book. And as I'm reading it, I'm thinking in my head. I feel very lucky to be able to be thinking about how I want to design my life. Yeah. I don't have student debt, and I'm at Berkeley, and you're teaching this class at Stanford, right. you know, places of high privilege, yep. and I was just wondering how you guys incorporate that element of privilege yeah. into the conversations and how you not facilitate students to think through that, that mm -hmm. element. Yeah. No, that's a great question. You want that um, um, you know, we we've been doing some uh, like radio shows, and, and people call up and say, "Yeah, this works if you're a Stanford person." I'm a trucker, but I'm, I, I drive a truck, so like, good luck with that. Thanks. You know, I, don't, I don't have I don't have any choices. <laughs> well, the okay. So <laughs> that's cool. Nice. What do we tell? Nice the segue, today? Bill. Yeah. Okay. The um, <laughs> step one is accept. We are brutally committed to reality, so. Design thinking does not have any magic wands to suddenly make your debt go away. You know, if I do an Odyssey plan, will, will the bank say, forget about it? No, that doesn't work. Um, but what we say is, look, you, we all have whatever degree of freedom over whatever degree of autonomy, uh, or the religious term would be domain sovereignty, that we have. So you start with, okay, so let's say you've got less choice than this person. Let's say, you know, I've got less choice than Amani does. Okay, well, that's better. This is worse. If I can't change that, that's just the way it is. And now, my, now it's not spend all my time being upset about what my choices aren't, but manage what my choices are. And so you, you want to live into whatever degree of freedom you have, because that's the power you have to make your life as much better as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you, you know, work as hard as you can to get more choice and what have you. But there's, there's not, we, we have no, we, we don't break laws of physics. You know, we don't fundamentally change power you know, structures. We have, a, we have a, a good friend of ours who's trying to, who's check, taking this curriculum into the community colleges. And in community colleges, it's not Berkeley. I mean, these are people just trying to maybe right. get an associate's degree and be a medical tech and not be a Starbucks, you know, barista anymore or something. Uh, but they've got they they got freedom. They've got a, they got a plan. They got a way to go. Right. We just I don't I didn't tell you this. We just got an uh, an invitation to teach this class in a prison. And I thought, wow. First of all, I'm really scared. I don't know if I'm, I'm that, that scares me. I mean, there's not a special thing. That's just scary. Um, and then two, it's like, well, okay, you you know, that's an interesting situation. I wonder what degrees of freedom mm. you have there, you know, and that might be a really challenging, mm. you know, uh, the, where does the model break down? You know, mm -hmm. right. what's your net? Uh, mm -hmm. one, one, one of the things we talk about is everybody's got a network, and your network mm -hmm. is going to be the way yeah. you move forward. Yeah, well, my network in prison is not that. No, we knew no. one guy who was in a community college and uh, was working in fast food and was aspiring to get into private security and was using the tools to network and do this kind of stuff, you know, and, very, and, and actually was able to get himself to meet, to, met a guy whose father actually ran a private security company, you know, you know night guards and that kind of stuff, you know, and, and, and that was a really exciting outcome for him. He did not have the tools to pull that off before. You know, so it's just where are you and where are you trying to go? You do, you, you do, we're trying to give people the best tools we can to do the yeah. best they so, can. So I, th I think the, uh, the shorter answer is we don't think this has anything to do with privilege, although I would, ask the I would ask the question, and I'd like to research, it has a lot to do with your network and who do you know who knows who you know. And clearly a student at Berkeley has a very different network than a kid, you know, in my down in my south of my neighborhood in Bayview, right. you know, who may never finish high school, right? So I think there's something that we could research there. There's probably a different way of approaching it. Last one. We'll do one more. Okay. Really good now. Really good question. Yeah. Um, the question is like because. Uh, I guess I graduated from college uh, a few years ago, and I'm working now. And the question is, like, how do you respond to that person that maybe is 40 and then like realizes they hate their job? Like, um, how, yeah, how do you respond to that? Like, do, I don't know, you encourage them to you know do the next five-year plan, but 
you know, they have concerns of like mortgage or kids yeah, or, sure, sure. You know, so yeah. like, yeah. There's all that reality stuff. Look, we got a big sign over the studio, the design studio at Stanford. It says, you are here. And, in, and one of the students put it there, but I keep it there because I want it's like to on remind. A sign, like on a map, you know. Yeah, I want to remind people. It's like, it's like that dot on a Google thing. You are here. I want to remind people that, um, all right, so you're 40 and you don't like, you, and you, and you end you up in the wrong You've three kids, place. you got a mortgage, you got right. an old Toyota, okay. So got it. now, uh, if you want to live in coherence and integrity, you're going to assess what you got, you're going to figure out, well, how you're gonna, maybe it'll take you five years to make the change. But do you really want to be that, that like lawyer who said, and I go to work every day and it steals a little piece of my soul? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't believe in soul the same way David does, but. But you don't want yours well, ripped I off. I mean, <laughs> whatever it is, I don't want to lose it. As an atheist, um, I got a little tiny one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, once so, you, and, and, and Dave, yeah. likes, Dave likes to say, you can't solve a problem you're not willing to have. Mm. So our first step right. is, do you mm. want to change? Mm -hmm. If, if mm. yes, here's a whole set of mm. tools and ideas. Use mm. the ones that are useful for you. Um, it isn't like, I'm going to quit my job and da 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 the, the, the incoherent change is the, the person who quits his job, divorces his wife, you know, buys the sports car, yeah. and is just as miserable, you know, two years later. That doesn't make any sense. So do something coherent. And, you know, we really don't believe you can have anything you want, just to be clear. We're, we're not that kind of fantastical people by any means at all. But there is a lot of can't, um, won't masquerading as can't, well, I can't, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. I think in most of those, in many of those sentences, the appropriate verb is won't, mm -hmm. or choose not to you know, suffer the consequences of, you know, um, living in a, well, you know, okay, I really hate this job, and I've got these three kids, all right, well, what kind of work would you like to do? Okay, there's other work I have to go back to school for, okay, so if you worked part-time and went back to school, and you moved into a really cheap one-bedroom apartment, you know, and your wife worked a swing shift on top, and you did that for eight years or six years, maybe you could make that transition. Would you like to do that? No, that's too hard. Okay, then I guess you decided you like what you're doing better. You just chose this. So I'm not saying it's a great choice, but you, people have more choice than they report. Um, and you, you know, are you willing to tell the truth about where you are? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, th and, the, and that truth will set you free, including to set you free to go back and go, you know, I think this is a pretty good box I'm in. I think, you know, I'm, you know, I had these kids. I think maybe I'll keep them, you know. There is you know, no return department it, at the OBGYN department. It's, I a, she, it's a pretty modern idea that your job is supposed to make you happy. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. my grandfather came from Germany, and he shoveled shit at the... Uh, at, you know, at the place where that accumulates, it was the, what do they call those? Um, waste treatment plant. The waste treatment plant for 50 cents a day, but then after two years made enough money to bring his wife and then his brother, and this was 1936 in Germany, so it was a pretty good choice. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, you know, and he went to work every day. He just did what he was supposed to do to raise the family. He wasn't sitting around going, am I fulfilled? Is shoveling shit really the thing that I was put on this earth to do? He was just making a living. <laughs> I feel called not to starve. Yeah, yeah he was yeah. making a living. And so, you know, yeah. sometimes we get pretty wrapped up in this notion that, you know, yeah. everything has to be, it's a, mm -hmm. yeah. the perfect parfait. Everything has to be in there. I want, yeah. the, I want the yogurt, and I want the blueberries, and I want the granola, and it's got to be exactly right. If and it's the not pink right. yoga mat, the pink one. Yeah, but if the, it's not right, um, I'm not happy. It's like, no, look, we're all elites here. I'm in this room, pretty much, I'm pretty sure. And, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't, don't go guilt tripping on yourself with that. Um, you know, uh, and um, oh, if you've got privilege and choice, that's great. And, and don't make that mad to who much is given, much is required, have you done the right thing? You know, I mean, there's plenty of that going on, you know, because the Christians, look, if you're a Christian, it's either better or worse. Like, have you prayed about that? You know, I mean, we do obligation, we beat the crap out of each other. Here's another Bible, let me hit you with it again. Um, so we're really good at that. You're either more free or a lot less, depends on how you practice it, you know, and so watch out for that. Uh, you want helpful Christians, not those you know, people reminding you where you're doing it wrong again and disappointing all of heaven at the time. Um, <clears throat> you, know, you thought you were just upset, all oh, heaven's crying over you. Oh, great, thanks. I'm really feeling good now. Um, so we're doing the best we can, 
And uh, if you've got a lot of choice, then you know, enjoy that and have a sense of responsibility to it. The world is not a fair place. Lots of people don't have the choice you do. Um, so you're just responsible for executing uh, what you can with what you've got. If you can free some other people up and improve the lot in their lives, well, that'd be a good thing. I mean, I'm, I'm an old boy scout. Let's leave the campground better than we found it. Um, so. Well, I think we could probably go on all night, but um, we ha our time is up. We have to stop yeah. now. But please join mm -hmm. me in thanking Bill and Dave. Thanks. Get the book. <laughs> For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.